really neat to introduce you. I mean, you are, you're like an icon, you know, like icon, icon. You're like an icon. Yeah, I, icon. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm talking to Howard Farron. This is outrageous. Um, I, I've, I've known you. We've known each other for years. Um, and so by way of a brief introduction, just because for those perhaps living in Antarctica who don't know you, um, you have been the literal media colossus in dentistry. Uh, Dental Town has got close to 250, 250,000 people, uh, 5,000 probably active every day. You've got Hogo running your CE. You've got a media colossus. Is, is Sam Middlestat still the editor of Dental Town? Yes, yes. Sam's there. You got Rebecca Parent, who's been with you, I think, since uh, since uh, Moses. That kind of thing. She's been around forever. Um, Priscilla, if I'm not mistaken, um, you've got the you know you've got Dental Town, the, the Towny meeting, the awards, which is very prestigious. Uh, you lecture. Uh, you told me one time how many days a year you lecture. Was it close to 100 or something, or 50 to 100, something like that, depending on the year. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think I've lectured thirty four to sixty four times a year. Um, but this August fortieth, uh, this August fourth is my thirty year anniversary of uh, lecturing, and uh, oh. it'll be thirty years. And uh, so I I feel like I've uh, been running for the mayor of Dentaltown for thirty years. I've lectured yeah, well, in well. countries, and that's how you get amazing information. Um, and that that's what I suggest. Uh, we're live on Facebook. Is um, you know. Um, when someone disagrees with you on Facebook, don't delete their account. It's, it's just, you balkanize into these camps. And what I love about Dentaltown is if you don't want to hear what someone else has to say to disagree with you, you, you can't delete their account. So, so, uh, you know, um, so if you're on Facebook, you know, keep, keep an open mind. Um, I don't even care if it's Facebook Karen. Um, if she asks something crazy, well, your patients are asking the same questions. So, right. right. So, so, as I say, I looked at this press kit. I, I didn't know where to begin. So the easiest way to ask the question is, where does Howard Farron begin? How does this all start? How do you go from dental school, uh, living in Kansas, uh, down in Arizona, and uh, by by well, I, it probably was one of the most demonstrative examples of organic growth uh, in the career of just about anybody. You're still a practicing dentist, I believe. You still go to work every day, like what, two, three times a week or something? Well, I, yeah, I, I still have a practice. Uh, I, I thought about selling my practice a, a couple of times, but then I realized I would have to uh, put an operatory in my home and have an a compressor and, an, you know, so it's just a lot easier to leave your hobby at, uh, at the office. Uh, but I, I want to sit there and say the um, dental town uh, was inspired by you at Root ZX. Well. Wow. And uh, my first, uh, the first, the first taste I ever had of social media um, was um, Yahoo Groups had a um, dentist at Yahoo Groups, and then um, a friend of mine who you were his idol, he passed away, Joe Dovkin, Joey D. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. Me and him yeah. were, um, we were roommates at and ninth floor Swanson Hall, Creighton University. Paul Gosar, who's a congressman, a dentist from Flagstaff, he was in that building. Well. And uh, John Dubkin, who practices out here, Joey's little brother, is um, just released a course on Dental Town. Um, he does. He's a, he adjudicated a thousand cases before the Arizona State Board of Dental Examiners. Wow. He's wrapped all that up into the Bible of um, dental um, practice, um, malpractice, and all that stuff. And uh, but anyway, um, Joey D called me up and said, "Hey, hey, subscribe to this." Uh, he said, "The smartest endodontist I know." Um, started this Root ZX and I signed up on it and it was 300 and some, uh, when I signed up, it was about 300 in it, honestly. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it kept growing and growing and growing, but I noticed something. So, so when I started reading these emails and realized every time I open my email, I'm reading all these posts from all these dentists, the hair on my arm stood up. I mean, it was so fun, but the lesson I learned from you um, was that um, on Root ZX, and there was a couple of other ones. There was Dave Dodell up the street had Internet Dental Forum. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Michael Barr um, had um, uh, dentists at Yahoo or 
dentists at CompuServe. I, I don't want to say dentists at CompuServe because all the millennials are like, well, CompuServe. <laughs> CompuServe. Yeah, right. And uh, if you have an AOL um, email, um, you, you know what CompuServe is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but so so basically, what I notice on um, Root ZX is that somebody would ask a question. And everybody would passionately answer it. Yep. And then like a month later, some new guy would join and ask the same question. And I got about half the response because we just discussed this a month ago. Right. And then two months later, somebody asked the third question again and no one reply. And then they call me and say, well, this group's horrible. They, they didn't, no one even replied. And I'm like, oh my God, we passionately debated this for a week. And yep. that was 90 days ago. So I instantly learned about the archive, and that's the only thing that's different about Downtown. All social medias are LIFO, last in, first out. Um, it's designed to capture your attention and entertain you and keep you on watching for hours. And Twitter and LinkedIn is where all the uh, dental manufacturers, if you have a million dollars or more and you're in dentistry, you're on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I got like 40,000 followers on LinkedIn and they're all, they're all like Stan Bergman of Shenry Shine, you know, and yeah, Trump, yeah. You know, all that. Um, President Trump um, lit up Twitter like nobody's business. I mean, I, uh, I mean, when Trump started running for the White House, every Republican dentist from about 50 to 75, boom, Twitter exploded. And, um, and what, what I, um, what I like is like, say, say you can't find an MB2. Um, if you just go to Dental Town and type in MB2, all 6 million posts are indexed, you pull up all the threads. So it's, uh, if, if you go into the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at ASU, um, or you go, to, you go to any scientific institution, they all use this same $300 message board software system because it's indexed, it's profiled. If you, if, if Ken put the most amazing post on there, and it was about um, a file system. I, I'd have to go to your page and just scroll back. Right. So, so, so Dental Town is is kind of an index <clears throat> reservoir. And, and by the way, I have a. Um, um, I was so excited to be on this interview because you were my first flavor to social media in dentistry. I, I, I had not thought of this till I was following Root ZX. So. Me and Joey, I, I thought Joey D was the smartest endodontist in the world until he told me, no, that you were. Uh, <laughs> you, were you remember wow. Joey D, don't you? Um, Joey D, you know what? I, did, I don't want to stop you because I want to listen to you for a couple of hours at least. Joey D was creating and inventing products before anybody really understood what that was all about. Uh, he had, if I'm not mistaken, by the, close to the time he passed away, uh, unfortunately, he had close to 30 different products. I once asked him if he would list them so people could have, you know, a repository of what he had done. And he said, no, you know, I just do it. It's kind of fun. I'm having fun doing it. I don't need to tell people what I'm doing. And it was kind of like, whoa. I mean, heavens to Murgatroyd. Um, his passing was a tragedy. He would have, I can only imagine what would be happening in endodontics if he were still here. It would be sad. Yeah, and he, he died of the same thing. Sam Walden died of multiple myeloma. And right, right. Just a horrible disease. Um, but I, I loved it. And I got to ask you, which, which, how would Joe Dubkin classify you? Because he broke up all endodontists into apical barbarians or pulp lovers. Uh, you either wanted to file all the way to the apex and have a puff of sealer out the apex, or you got within a half millimeter and uh, you love the pulp. So were you Joey D's apical barbarian or were you a pulp lover? No, actually, it's funny. I mean, I'm not quite sure what I was in those days, but the evolution has become the recognition that endodontics works because of the immune system. And the healthier you are, irrespective of your technique, your material, um, you know, obviously, if you're going to file and have the atrogenic problems, that's a whole other ball of wax. Or if you restore teeth inappropriately, that's also tragic. But I've spent a lot of time with Anil uh, who I will be interviewing on May the 17th. So when I was instructing at U of T, I got to know him really well. He's one of the most, the guy's a genius. University of Tennessee in Memphis? No, no, he's in Toronto. Oh, uh, Toronto. And he's, yeah, he's in Toronto. And he's been doing work on uh, biofilm eradication using nanoparticle, chitosan particle materials. About to go to, uh, about to, go to market with uh, Sergio Cutler and, uh, what's his name, Bruder. George, George? George Bruder? Anyway, um, I think when he comes to market and John McSpadden is about to do the same thing shortly, uh, I think that to me is finally, 
finally, finally, the definitive answer to endonautics, which so if I was going to label myself something, I would call myself an irrigation fanatic in endodontics because the file is just a conduit. Um, you know, I, I think if endodontics did like you did, like we'll talk a second about how you got to, uh, you, you were born in Kansas, right? Uh, so how'd you end up in Phoenix? We'll talk about it in a second. But if you learn anything over the course of time, you know, if you reflect back, um, all of that timeline in endodontics was about instrumentation. And quite honestly, instrumentation will probably not disappear, but between lasers, um, irrigation systems that are coming, that are more sophisticated uh, and not necessarily more costly, um, like um, my brain, general wave, uh, and other things, I think you're gonna see endodontics rattling change, more regeneration, more stem cells. And uh, I think even if you look at your endo board right now, hopefully that transition is occurring. So if I was gonna qualify anything, I think the thing that you have stimulated more people than anything else, is that knowledge is not terminate, it does, you know, it's not finite. Knowledge is infinite, and if you go to the archives and kind of, you know, it's not even low-hanging fruit, you can pluck what you want, engage in discourse, and then you, you mushroom. I mean, when I, I think you were married to Judith at the time when I first met you, if I'm not mistaken, and both of you were starting this out, and the one thing, you were very focused on the publication, which was very much the standard, uh, you know, the sort of standard at that time. But you suddenly realize that media, and I don't mean print media, you realize that digital media was going to be the wave of the future. And so even the way you found your practice, I find fascinating. Okay, most people say, well, you know, I'm in town, I want to find the space, I'm going to associate. That's not how you did it. You're, you were a businessman before you, no, that's wrong. You understood business and the mechanism for doing it long before you became an MBA. So that's a fascinating story. Could you share it? Well, I, I want to go back to the publication. Um, I had written 10 articles in the, when I got out of school. I was writing articles. And I had submitted 10 to the journal, the American Dental Association in Chicago, and they had published four. Mm -hmm. And they published the four lamest ones. And I called up and I said, no, 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 I, I really want you to publish this one and this one. And they just like smile. I go, Howard, um, you don't have any filters and we can't say that. And I said, well, did you like it? They go, oh, I loved it, but I, I can't print that. And, and so people, it's kind of like they would go give a lecture and it'd be really boring. Then that night at the bar, five drinks later, the guy's lit up, given the yeah, best lecture. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, why didn't you talk like that? You know, uh, but but I want uh, but I want to be a really selfish person. And I want to, um, I was looking so forward to being, uh, talking to you today about the changes in endonics. So Arizona was the only state where a pro-business governor, Ducey, um, said, um, if you're licensed to practice anywhere in America, you can practice in, in Arizona. And, and, and they, they'd have been having shortage of nurses for 30 years, but a nurse in Albuquerque says, <clears throat> well, I'd have to go through all the board. So he deregulated. So, so Arizona has been ground zero for DSOs. And it's about 18% of um, all the dentists in Arizona. It's 18.6, according to ADA of Arizona dentists work for a DSO. Mm -hmm. And that long tail going down, there's five states at the other end that don't even have 1%. So we have the most, um, nationally, it's probably about 12%. Um, you know, Sam Bergman says he thinks they're 12% of the offices, but they buy 18% of the supplies. So mm -hmm. around there somewhere. But it's so funny because whenever I talk to the DSOs that are actually owned by a dentist, you know what they say about endodontist? I got to I got to share it because I know you'll laugh your head off uh, because there's a kernel of truth in everything. Um, <clears throat> the easy, the most profitable um, dentist they can buy is always an oral surgeon, even though the oral surgeon demands a three hundred thousand dollar base pay. They don't even care, and even though they pay him forty five percent in production, they don't even care because every set of wisdom is a thousand dollars, and these guys come in and even straight out of school, they're just making bank. And, and by three years out, a lot of their oral surgeons are actually taking home $750,000 a year. When they started their DSO, endodontists were number two. Because mm -hmm. when I got to Arizona in 87, <clears throat> I don't want to mention any names because I might get back to Matt Laff and Lebo and all the great older endodontists out here. But those guys were all doing like eight or nine molars a day 
and big money, big, big, big practices, great. And then came the microscope. And um, the microscope, um, the, these DSO docs, they say things like, oh, my God, what do those endodontists think they're doing? Neurosurgery? What are they attaching nerve endings down there? And it's lowered their productivity from eight to nine to four to five. And I had one DSO dentist yelling at me the other day saying, my, my God, they're, they're going to go all the way down to the profitability of, of a pediatric dentist or a periodontist, and they're headed towards general dentist. And um, they, they say, if you, and, and now the endodontist, when they're all done, they want to buy another $70,000 machine and hook it up and put it through a washing machine cycle and this and that. And, and, um, and then this guy was so mad. He says, you know, probably 20 years from now, we'll have to pay the patient $1,000 just to do the damn root canal. So, um, so it is funny where, you know, that you're supposed to hold up your hand and if you're going to do something, it's got to pass all five fingers. It's uh, is the thumb technically a finger or is that? Do I have 10 fingers or do I have eight fingers and two thumbs? Do I have 10 fingers? Um, five, you know, is it faster? Is it easier? Is it higher quality? Is it lower cost? Is it smaller? And it gets tricky with dentistry. And um, you know, I look at the insurance data and the insurance data says, well, if I have the endodontist do a million root canals in five, and we're just going to go with extraction because you're never going to get two endodontists to <laughs> Is, did this root canal work or not work? And you're saying there's a, you know, there's all, but, but is the tooth no longer in the mouth? That, that's a black or white deal. And they're saying if they do 100 million root canals by endodontists in five years, 60 months, 5% are, have been extracted for whatever reason. And in general dentists do it, it's 10%. So on this, you know, it, we're talking about a 5% variance, one out of 20 between an endodontist and a general dentist. And, um, so they're, they're getting more expensive. But your question was, how did I get out to Phoenix or what well, was? You, you did, I mean, <laughs> a few things came out of that. The claim that you have no filters. And so the question is, who cares, right? I mean, if that's your thought process, go for it. Because, you know, it's like anything else. You, you never know how things are going to, Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. You know what you want to say, you know what you want to do. So who cares if you're taking all kinds of paths to get there? At least it indicates that you're transactionally thinking. So that was number one. And number two, uh, your dad was a data. What was his business? He was in data? Well, he was, uh, he married my mom, you know, in high school, you know, like, like I met um, Judith, the mother of my four boys, uh, 10 minutes before high school started. We were, I met her when I was 14 and uh, uh, took 10 years to marry her, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But um, they moved from Parsons, Kansas. They came out to uh, Wichita and he delivered rainbow bread. And he made about 11,000 a year and they were uh, Catholic. So they thought any form of birth control you'd go to, they didn't just say you'd go to hell. They said you'd go to Gehenna, a burning pit of sulfur for eternity. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I'm, I don't even think they thought Lutherans would make it. But um, so he, here he was, you know, trying to feed seven kids, delivering bread, $11,000 a year. And he saved up his money and he really liked this Sonic drive-in franchise, which is kind of funny because that's where you stay outside and eat in the car. And now dental offices, the waiting room has now moved to Sonic drive-in. You're going to go wait in the car in the waiting room. Yep. And, and my dad loved it because he was a health food fanatic. And when he was waiting for his cheeseburger, he wanted to be able to sit out in his car and smoke. He didn't want to have to put out the cigarette and go inside and wait for his french fries. So he opened up that Sonic drive-in and um, the first year he went from like $11,000 a year salary to 60 grand. And as a 10 year old little boy, I, 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 the impact on our family was just ginormous. And, and so I started thinking, wow, that your career really has a, a deal. And then it was very scalable because they had a model. So he opened up a second one, a third one. By the time he opened up the fourth or fifth one, we moved out to the richest area of Wichita, which was Hidden Lakes Estates. And there my next door neighbor was Kenny Anderson, the dentist, who's still been practicing for 50 years. And I would go to work with the love of my life, dad, but I'd make hamburgers and onion rings. I'd go to work with Kenny and we didn't, we didn't have all this technology. The new technology of the time for me was this x-ray that would look through a tooth, which I just was freaked out. And then Kenny would do a root canal and he did them all in like five minutes. This is this thing called Sargeni. Um, the Italians are, are much, uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I don't, I hope I don't trigger you. Um, and, um, and then he would um, put the impression in and bite down and he'd hand out to his lab man, who the next operatory was a one man with a wafer and he'd do the stone, cast gold crown, 
And then the patient come back and they'd cement it with zinc phosphate cement. And uh, oh, I would, it was just in love. And so I wrote my dental school letter in the sixth grade, um, asking them how you I could- wrote your dental school letter in the sixth grade. And what's so cool is, you know, they had file charts. So Diane Beer just counted the years to figure out when I actually could make it and put it in a chart. And when I got there, Diane Beard actually went to her file cabinet, pulled out the drawer and showed me the letter. I wrote her in the seventh grade and it was hilarious because, you know, it was a pen and paper. <clears throat> and I told her I, I wanted to be a dentist really, 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 really. Uh, I had like five reallys. And then I told her I wanted to be Flip Wilson's dentist because he had the nicest teeth. Do you even remember who Flip I do was? remember Flip. What was, what was his those? line? Uh, oh, no, oh, Jesus. Char Charlene or, or? No, he, he, had a, he had a catchphrase for the life of me. I'll have to look it up because I don't recall. I'm sorry. So, Go ahead. So then, you know, the, the whole deal is these kids should be doing, and I want to say I, I've noticed it for 32 years. These young kids that come knock on your door in high school and undergrad and dental school. I've been watching those kids come out and they all remind me of me and you. I mean, they, they all, the cream floats the top. They're, they're ambitious, they're fearless. They come knock on your door. And I kept up a friendship with um, um, Perpard, uh, who was a stand-up dentist, um, Knudsen, David Knudsen. Um, um, oh my God, there was just a ton of them on West Side. And they had camaraderie back then. Um, the, on the west side of Wichita on Maple Street was the bowling alley. And Thursdays, they all met for lunch. All these competitors, that's why they didn't sue each other and throw each other under a bus and all this crazy stuff. They were all on a first name basis. And, and if you didn't like um, working on children, you gave it to Sam. He wasn't a pediatric dentist. And that's the one thing I wanted. To, the second thing I wanted to ask you the most right now and why I was so excited to see um, seriously, me and Joey D, we started a two-person mutual admiration club, and you were our honorary leader. Um, but all those great endodontists, you mentioned John McSpadden. He didn't go to Ambo school. He no, just John was brilliant. Ben Johnson. Did you ever meet John? Did you, I'm sorry for interrupting. Did you ever meet John? Not only did I meet him, I, I called him up with so many questions. He says, well, just, just fly down here. The yeah, day. come down to Tennessee, and we'll talk. Flew he, down uh, look out Mountain was in Georgia, but yeah, you know, yeah me up in his limousine and let me spend the whole day and then when i told him i need to find a hotel he's like well i have all these bedrooms yeah, yeah. find a bed or a couch but the thing and ben johnson did the same thing when i called up ben john this was before lecturing it was in the 80s i yep. waited to me from adam and he said he said son you, you have a lot of questions and he goes you're in phoenix they have southwest airlines direct flights to tulsa he goes why don't you come down and spend the day and that day turned into the night and the next day. By the way, did you see that video Ben Johnson uh, said from Brad Gettleman, who sent it to me, of the yeah. world's oldest root canal? Yeah, world's oldest root canal. Uh, it was, yeah. The guy's name was Johnson, I think, if I'm not mistaken. The guy yeah, actually real. was scary. So, so, so a lot of these, um, so in the 32 years, I've seen many, many examples. And I, I don't want to get people in trouble or embarrass them or whatever. But like there was this town in Albuquerque and it had like eight dentists. And one dentist loved endo, and one dentist loved pediatric dentistry, and everyone else hated it. And one just, they just decided one day, um, well, I can't let you do my root canals because I want to do the crown. So one day he just said, well, I'm practice limited to endodontics. And he's been doing seven, eight, you know, however, he's been like an endodontist ever since. And the other person loved kids and just said, I won't work on anyone over 18. So a lot of these kids are coming out and I, I don't care how you sugarcoat this. Um, the, the COVID class of 2020 graduating class, finding a job, um, you know, they're going to have better luck walking through the desert looking for meteorites in, in the sand. Um, oh. I mean, it, it's going to be tough because, because number one, the DSOs um, um, are, you know, the, they're, they're not in any expansion mode. Number two, mm -hmm. um, the dentists that, that had um, associates, um, you know, you're, we, we won't know. Our, our dental office opens up on Monday again, along with 13 states, Alabama, mm -hmm. Arizona, Georgia. So we don't know what demand is, but I guarantee you, if demand is down 25%, the last thing you're going to do is increase your capacity. I mean, a business is like a go-kart. It's got two pedals. So when you have a line of customers outside your door, 
then you hit the gas and you add capacity. You add more dentists, more chairs. If you're a restaurant with 10 tables, you go to 20 tables. And that's called line queuing theory. And you only see lines in government and healthcare. That's why, that's why the big government people don't realize that they, they've only had about 11% approval rating for the United States government since I graduated from high school in 1980. So hmm. when they're trying to raw, raw, like, uh, oh, be a Republican or be Democrat, it, it's a binary star since the um, Civil War in 1862, and the Republicans and Democrats together have taken this thing off a cliff. It's kind of like one of them drove the, one, one of them robbed the bank and one drove the getaway car, and you're all <laughs> Because you're, I mean, I mean, picking between a Republican and Democrat is like saying, do you want your leg amputated above or below the knee? Would you rather die of a heart attack or cancer? I mean, I mean, they're they're horrible. Um, but um, so um, that that um, I'm just trying, where, where was I going with this? What? You know, DSOs and just how the demand is going to change. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so we we don't know. Where, where the demand is, is going. And we're not going to know for probably at least a full quarter. And in that quarter, 30 million Americans lost their job. That's yeah. all the job gains since the last bubble pop. So that 30 million people lost their job. They lost their dental benefits. They lost their income. They lost all this. Like so the, these, these graduating class of COVID 2020, I mean, they, they don't have a chance of finding gainful employment. And they had big dreams of coming out and making 150,000 a year and getting a car and a house and blah, blah, blah. But one thing I was thinking of is the greatest endodontist I know uh, from back in the day, um, uh, John McSpadden uh, yeah. in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Ben Johnson, a, a whole host of them never went to endo school. They just had no. just limited to endodontics. So if you want to be an endodontist, and you're already four hundred thousand dollars in debt, which blows my mind that these private schools they send these letters to the students as if they're like the nonprofit sacred bleeding heart of Jesus Mary school, and they're like, oh, you know, we would sure like some donate donations. I give you a hundred thousand a year. I owe you four hundred thousand plus interest. <laughs> and in any of their faculty, it's like, well, what do you do this weekend? Oh, well, there's a dental school meeting in Palm Springs, and next week's it's in Scottsdale. Then there's one in Italy so their 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 owners are flying all around the world they got big old trust funds they spend money like drunken sailors almost as bad as the federal government of the United States I mean just, just and, and then and then try to hit up these poor suckers that gave them four hundred thousand um, for a dental license I you know I, I you can't say this on air but I wish someone would send me a box and ask for a donation to your your private dental school because you'll get the box back yeah. and it'll be something you're not expecting <laughs> so, so i don't so if i wanted to be an endodontist i wouldn't sign up to give those guys three hundred thousand the only reason they don't drain all your blood and sell it is because it might be illegal and they'll be sued if they could they would i would go i would go be an associate with an endodontist until I could find a job, and then I would just come out. You do, I just think you know, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you were talking about DSOs, and something literally just popped into my head. Um, these, does this apply around the world, do you think? I mean, post-COVID is going to make the entire world of dentistry suffer? Well, when we go around the world, first of all, you know, um, Einstein was very clear. There's no past and there's no future. We only know the present. I can't walk you outside at night and point to a full moon and then point to the direction of the Big Bang. There, I, I, there's no direction to point to it. It's, it's, it's gone. So when people start predicting the future, and you know, they did this with Wall Street, you know, it was all these algorithms and sorts. And what people don't know that don't do math is that they're all based on assumptions. Mm -hmm. And the biggest algorithms were made for Wall Street, and that showed how good they were for the 2008 fiasco when the fastest computers that money could buy, the whole thing crashed. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same software for global warming. I mean, all you have to do is go back and watch um, An Inconvenient Truth and look at all those predictions. And mm -hmm. that was a decade ago, and none of them came true. And But it's the same math. It's assumptions. And are they right or wrong? Well, a broken clock's worked twice a day. So, so when someone tells you 
anything about the future. Call Warren Buffett. I went to Omaha, Nebraska, the Oracle Omaha, and he came and lectured to our business class because he liked the uh, instructor guy. And, it, and he's got the most money in the world. And you said, Where, where's the market going to be in a year from now? He, he would think you're, you're stoned. I mean, it's like, I mean, so, so there is no future, no past, so no one can make a prediction. But what am I optimistic about? I'm optimistic about, you know, if you, if you reduce the world, the seven and a half billion people into three people, one of them has an iPhone smartphone like you and me do. One of them has a cell phone, but no internet connection. And one of them has nothing. But the United States, the median average age, because to reach herd immunity, you need half the people to have it. Some say you need two out of three. The minimum ones are saying half. Well, in the United States, half would be 39 and a half years old. So let's just say 39. If everybody 39 and under had ran through this where there's almost zero mortality, I mean, it's like it's under 1%. Um, that's why Sweden didn't close down their schools. They said, that's the half we want to go through this first. We don't want the nursing home grandma half to do this first. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it really sucks. I'm lucky because I'm um, 60 and over. It's hitting really hard. But I, I see those viruses and they come out to me and then they see that I'm only 57. And I'm thinking about taping my uh, driver's license to my forehead. <laughs> and get a little faster and they just come up and, they, and then they fly away like a hummingbird and uh, so i made it by two years uh, but um so we don't know but what i'm positive about the uh, or what i'm optimistic about the the poor the underdeveloped is uh you know uh, central and south america africa and asia all those pockets is that africa's median average age is 19. i mean so half that population is gonna be able to fight that a lot better than Ken Sirota and Howard Ferran, let alone all those people in the nursing home. Uh, so um, I don't know what it's gonna be, but in the 20 richest country, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna focus on the United States because um, um, that's proper. And um, to those of you around the world, um, Ken is in Canada, which lays, above, it's like California, but it lays to the north. Um, California and Canada, they both have the same number of dentists, yep. they have the same number of people, yep. they have the same GDP. It's really two countries. So we got California on the left and Canada laying on the right. And um, the Canadians are statistically, they're the most educated population in the world. I think 39% of your adults have a college degree. Yep. And um, um, I, I'm sure when you look down from the loft at America, um, you're just like, oh, those kids are crazy. And then you go back to bed and hope and you wake up, it won't be too bad. But America, I don't like the term the United States of America because it's not very applicable. Nobody refers to the EU as the EU. You can't compare Germany to Denmark. You can't compare Portugal to Italy. You can't compare, you know, you know it, it's a crazy term. You can't compare Anchorage to San Fran. You can't compare Alaska, Kansas to New York City. Um, so, so the United States, people forget, they'll, they'll always say, well, well, Denmark did this. Denmark has less people than Arizona. I mean, we're the third most populous country. Uh, China's got a billion three. India's got a billion one. The United States has a third of a billion. Indonesia's four at 225. So when people say, oh, but, but um, Canada does this. I, well, that's not my group. Show me what China, India, the United States, the, um, you know, show me what a country is doing that has at least a hundred million people. And if you're going to show me what, what Reykjavik did in Iceland, show it to Omar Reid. That's where he's from. But, you know, America is a huge country. And I can tell you this um, about Trump. Uh, love him. I, I, I don't even care what your politics are. But the bottom line is um, he was elected president because a lot of people voted for him and he knows where that ballpark is and 51 percent of america i assure you it thinks this is insane they're broke they ran out of money um and, and that includes my four boys all four of my boy and my 82 year old mother when i tell my 82 year old mother i i, I told her i she I, she said i said well why don't you just stay home and watch movies she goes, well, I don't have cable. I'm not paying for cable. And I, so I, so I bought, I paid for a cable. It's $186 a month. It's like, well, maybe she'll stay in there and watch movies. And you know, her response is, she says, Howie, you know, you, you've always been a go-getter and, and now you're, you're scared. 
staying in your house. She goes, I never would have expected my little Howie is afraid of some, some germ. You know, you need to, is, is there something wrong? I mean, my four boys, it's so embarrassing because I've been under social isolation. They come to the door and I don't want them to come in and hug them. The ones that live in here, that, that, that was too late, but the ones that don't live in here, they you know, and their dads are driving around, but Oh man, you know what it feels like when the little two-year-old grandson looks at his mommy and says, why can't we go inside? And she goes, shh, shh, grandpa's scared. Yeah, grandpa's scared. And I was like, oh my God. So here's what I'm telling you. There are, in dental, I've been in dental in America 32 years. There's been a lot of research on market research. Big billion dollar corporations get universities to pick a sample and do a survey. And the United States has always been, has had two dental markets. One only buys on price and they're gonna go cheapest, PPO, HMO, whatever. And they don't give a fly in rat's rear about this coronavirus. So you could open back up all the dental offices tomorrow with no changes. And my four boys, my mom would be right back, no changes, they don't even care. Now the other half is like me, they're, they're you know, it's not that so much as scared, it's like, what is the risk reward? Like I went parachuting one time, because my comptroller, Stacy, at 20 years, she couldn't get anybody to go with her. And I thought, I'll go do it because I just, you know, she wanted to do this. But I only jumped out of a perfectly good airplane one time. This isn't something I would do daily. Um, I would go back to work tomorrow um, if I didn't have grandkids and all that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know why. I, I don't have to work. I miss work. I mean, I love pulling... <laughs> pulling four wisdom teeth is my golf and my god a molar retrain there's not anything more fun than that now i'm bored to death of um you know restorations and when i go in there and it's a quadrant of mod composites on two three four five and you know you're just gonna sit down there there's no shortcuts it's a freaking hour i mean that's like for me at 57, that, that's like mowing the lawn, loading the dishwasher, changing the oil on your car. I, you don't get excited about that stuff, but I still get excited about surgery. I still get excited about endo. Um, I love my grandchildren and I'd rather just be shot than be a pediatric dentist. I mean, I, I just, just tell me what corner you want me to stand on for the drive-by. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but, um, but the bottom line is the other half, um, they're scared. And what's going to get rid of their half? Well, when they come out with a vaccine, but come on, let's talk about vaccines. I mean, um, they, the New York Times, uh, I mean, I'll just, I'll just go through some simple headlines. The last president that tried to hurry up a vaccine uh, was, um, um, gosh darn, uh, um, it was President Gerald Ford in 1976. And he and the swine flu came back and he tried to um, speed up. The federal government has launched Operation Warp Speed to deliver a COVID-19 by January. The last time the government tried that, it was a total disaster. Ford was president. Anyway, it goes on. The vaccine came out. Uh, it didn't work. Um, and then not only did it not work, it had side effects. Um, Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine, and Albert Sabin, the other scientists, they were all screaming and yelling at each other. And then when the thing started not working, it, it, was, it was just a shit show. So, so and, and, then, and then these guys go on to say that they've been trying to get a vaccine for the coronavirus and the rhinovirus and the common cold since 1960, never got it once. So if you're waiting for the vaccine, you might as well just, you, you might very possibly um, be waiting a long time. And then the CDC says of all their influenza vaccines, because we never got one for coronavirus, coronavirus, for, for, the, for the influenza vaccine, it, they, they, the best one worked at 71% and the worst one was at 19%. So, so the best you could hope for is 70%, which means a third of the people won't even work on. So, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just oh, yeah. know what you're saying. You've got DSOs. Some of them have, what, thousands of practices, this sort of thing. So you've got massive numbers of patients, diminishing numbers of dentists. Even the patients will drop off. What are these companies that are so dependent on production going to do to deal with PPE and all of the things that are required to get into, you know, uh, diminished aerosols, uh, protective equipment, um, triaging, uh, you know, having teams in case one of the teams gets COVID, then they move to another team. 
So you've got these, these hedge fund owners, these VC owners who are running the show. They're all dentists. Uh, majority of them are. And so they're, they're, uh, they're going to be in a position where they're not going to get return on their investment. They're gonna, even if they, if they have shareholders, they're not going to get return to the shareholders. Um, what are they going to do? Howard? Like, I mean, you understand business better than most. That's why you're running courses on MBA, understanding of dental care. Um, what's a DSO, which is taking over a very large segment of the dental market in the United States. It is corporate increasingly. So what are they going to do in terms of keeping financially alive? Well, I, I want to be clear with how I say it because I'm, I'm podcast interviewing friends with all, all these guys and um, um, gentlemen can disagree and all that stuff. But we already had our first casualty and, uh, and DSOs are big in Europe too and Finest Dental. I mean, everybody woke up to Finest Dental was closed and that was a earth shattering DSO moment. Everybody's like, holy shit. And I, um, I you know, was already knew who their controller was, their accountant and all that stuff like that. But of course, they, um, you know, I, I, I can't say what I know. Um, but you do have Finest Dental in there. Um, you have the DSOs all banging on the door at the White House trying to, to get money. And um, I don't know if they're going to get that. But I do know this. Um, they're, they're businessmen. They're, they're going to get all the money they can back. And, if, and that's going to mean that, you know, instead of um, some DSOs are, are paying their dentist forty percent of production. If you're when they invite you to come back to work, trust me, they're going to be asking for a lower amount. That's a no-brainer. Um, they're, they're they certainly weren't born to provide jobs for dentists. They're they're businessmen. They're trying to make more money, and um, so I think you can tell by some of their behaviors of which ones is was the CEO cashed out and it doesn't matter and he's not leveraged versus the ones that have their whole their whole livelihood and all their money involved. Um, yeah, there, there's a panic on the street, but, but what they're gonna see is, again, we have two markets. Half the market, you know, you got, you got um, Rick Workman owns a thousand Heartland Dentals, um, Bob Fontana owns a thousand Aspen, Steve Thorne owns six, eight hundred. Um, uh, and everybody always talks about those three, Stephen, Bill, J uh, all those out of Chicago. But the average DSO is only like three locations. It's a group practice. And so the, the three, the big three DSOs grab all the headlines and the, um, the but the average DSO is about three locations uh, and, and they should be about four because DSOs is a great model at level one. Level one is I'm in a small town of Wichita, Kansas. There's 300,000. I got a practice on the West side. Uh, but you know what? It'd be a lot um, cheaper media if I had an office on the east side, south side, north side, because then I can go to TV, I can go to radio, I can go to the newspaper, I can go to direct mail. And, and then with four locations, I have one level of management. And these dentists, like when I got out of school, I mean, I, I spent 10 years to get my FAGD, my MAGD, my diplomat, the International Congress of Oral I had so many initials behind my name, I consolidated them all into just BFD. And now I'm Howard Fran, BFD. And, and, and it was too many hats to wear. And, and so these dentists, they can't on top of uh, learning endo and implants and Invisalign know how many people um, landed on their web page this month. Because uh, they don't know that for every 100 that land on their web page, only three converted and made a phone call. They don't know that. Um, when the three people call the office, they don't realize that three people called before your reception converted one to come in. The dentist doesn't know that he told three patients, they each had a cavity and only one converted and had their treatment done. So let's reverse that. For the conversion was one, you, you needed three people to come in to do one filling, which means nine had to call, which means uh, you know several hundred had to land on your website. You can fix anything on that funnel. So DSOs can come in and say, well, hell, just if you had a little chat box, you doubled the metrics on your website. Um, when they call your office, if after three rings, it rolls over to a call center. If every call is answered on the three rings, their offices get about 12 more scheduled patients a day. And then you go into a dental office and you, and this, this guy doesn't know that one third of all of his phone calls go into voicemail. He doesn't know that it's that in the last quarter, 500 messages in voicemail were never even listened to. 
So they, so that first layer, you can come in and you can say, okay, we're going to get an accountant. See, I've got a controller. I've had Stacy for 20 plus years. Um, um, I have a um, HR. I, my, my president uh, is Lori Zalowski. She's my right yeah, hand. Lord. Yeah, Lori. So, so one layer of management, they'll make everything happen faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, more efficient. Where it all goes to hell in a handbasket is then when a national DSO comes back and buys this group and they want an additional 17% off the top. Dude, my lab and supplies combined ain't 17%. What are you going to do for me that would negate all my lab and supplies? So it, it just mathematically doesn't add up. Now, it could add up if those guys said one set of 17%. I want 7%, hell, the government bonds not even paying 2%, 7%, let's not get too greedy, you double your money every 10 years, but they're, they're not into that. They're, they're Wall Street, man. They, they wanna suck your blood tonight. So I, so I think a lot of these big, big, these local DSOs, will they have one layer of management in one town or one state, they'll have a better fight, especially if they're in what I call a flyover state. And a flyover state is all the Democratic um, elections won are in the Northeast and a few little states. And then the red area in the middle, they just don't have an identity with Washington, D.C. And they're broke and they're going back to work and they got guns and their freedom and they don't care. Half of America is past that. Again, my four boys and my mom. Um, I think that when I look at traffic count, they have traffic stuff on these cell phones. The lowest, when the peak of the, you know, the five stages of grief, shock, denial, um, depression, warning, acceptance, <laughs> anger, whatever, whatever. Yeah. You know, at the height of the shock, traffic did not drop 40%. In Arizona, it got down to like 38 drop. Now it's not even dropped 20. And every time I talk to my boys, I'm like, well, what's traffic like out there? They go, dad, you'd never know there anything was going on. Right. So that's where we're at now. Is this going to come back? Well, what's the stock market going to be? If you, if you want to read the future, it doesn't exist. But I'm telling you where the people are at. So I'm going to ask you another question. Um, the United States was probably the most dominant economy in the world. The others are suffering dramatically. They're talking about a recession in the United States. So I'm going to choose an example. Stan, Stan Bergman, Henry Schein, $16 billion company, global in its outreach. Um, so all of these things in America, they may not be identical to the UK, to Europe, to you know, Middle East and whatnot, but there still is an overlay, um, different cultural considerations, whatever. But the companies still have headquarters that perhaps in America, perhaps like Dead by Serona is gonna be in wherever it is. Um, but if I were Stanley Burton and I saw my profits and, or growth sales drop probably more than 50% in the last little while, um, and I'm coming out of this, would I see this as an opportune time to include a division in my company that would include owning dental practices so that I have a built-in uh, supply chain? Like instead of just relying on preferred providers, like, uh, you know, you're, you, you, you kind of deal with Heartland and, you know, you're going to give them discounted price of discounted materials and sundries and whatnot. If I was Bergman and I say, you know what, I got a billion dollars. I mean, I, you know, cash reserves, whatever. Would I go out and buy a thousand dental practices and guarantee I always had a supply chain for my distribution? Um, is that something they would ever think about post COVID? Um, I have asked them all that. Um, they all, deny it and completely um um it's, it's been interesting because let's go to greater new york meeting which is still on i called them i actually called them myself. greater new york is still on yeah well dennis were calling me and they were asking me because if you went to the greater new york website meeting and it said future meetings they just listed the 21 22 meeting so they assumed they're not listening to 2020 so i called them and they said oh no that well that's because that's future meetings this year is this meeting and I said, well, and she said, thank you so much for telling me. I can see how you can misread that. But they're, they're still um, scheduled to go on there. Um, but I, I, um, I have talked to these, uh, these owners about that. And 
they they do not want to get in there. In fact, Benko is um, is so glad it didn't get into uh, Dentrix like Shine did. Right. Or Patterson like uh, like uh, um, uh, Patterson bought EagleSoft and Effingham where Harlan is because when something goes wrong with um, one of those softwares, your supply rep comes in and then you're ripping her a new one because all this stuff isn't working with the computer software. And and then when they get really 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 mad. Um, they go to Benko or Burkhart, not because they're better, it's because they're not Shine and they're not Patterson. So um, these monopolies, you know, if you go all through history, you know, when I was born in 62, mm -hmm. the average Fortune 500 stock was worth, uh, was, um, was, had been publicly traded longer than I was. I, they, they were all grandpas. By the time um, now, um, they're not even 20 years old. So the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company has gone from 60 plus years to under 20 years in my lifetime. And it's headed down the, the, the competition for the zebras to cross the river and the gazelles um, um, not getting eaten. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to last 10 years and somebody's going to eat you. And usually from behind, you're never even going to see uh, where this thing come from. Um, but, but when you go to the greater New York meeting, Amazon was always there and they were there and, and, and everybody was thinking, okay, are they going to buy Patterson? Are they going to, who are they going to buy? What are they going to do? And I would keep going to the CEOs and I'll never forget the CEO I had on Dentistry Uncensored. Um, the head of uh, 3M's dental division. And I said, um, so when do you think you're going to start selling all your supplies on, on uh, 3M on Amazon? And he goes, Howard, it's really interesting. You know, um, I get that question asked every day for years, but it's never from a dentist. And that was my insight into dental town. If you go back to when I first got exposed and you're the one who exposed me to social media. And the second guy was um, Generation Next, Michael Maroon. Michael Maroon, yeah. Then sure. it was Michael Barr of uh, Dentists at CompuServe and Dave Dodell up the street uh, for IDF. Um, but, when the, but I didn't like LIFO, so I wanted the index. But the internet was described as five Cs. It was gonna be a place for content. It was gonna be a place for commercials and banner ads, connectivity, all the devices, commerce, like Amazon sell stuff, and community. And, and when I started my website, 20 other websites started and a lot of them got big time venture capital money. And I don't wanna mention any names that Dental Exchange got $20 million and burned through it all and had nothing to show for it. The, the, the bottom line was, and, and it was because I was a real dentist. And, yeah. and when they said, when they said, well, you could buy all your supplies online and you wouldn't have your supply girl. And I'm like, I wouldn't have my supply girl. I mean, that's my only connection to the community. I mean, when she comes in, I'm not going to ask her if she likes Tulsa Dental Files. I'm going to say, hey, how many endodontists do you know in my backyard that you know where the file is? And then she picked up the phone and she called Gettleman and Matt Loff and Lee Bow and Jason Hales. And while I was doing some other procedure, when I was done, I came back on my deal. And when she left, she had a list of seven endodontists in the files they use. I'm, and so when they started saying, you know, you'll get this website, you'll never have to have a community. I'm like, that's the only part I want. So I already said right out of the gate, I'm going to do content, commercials, connectivity, all that bullshit. I just want to go connect with someone like Ken Sirota. So when I say, hey, I was taking a working length film and the file actually poked out the top of the head, <laughs> you uh, recommend for that. So the community was everything. And Amazon, four years in a row, they looked like the men in black. And I would go talk to the men in black and they'd say, it's a weird industry. I mean, it's not like they're going to buy everything in a box because they got a compressor that goes out. They got a chair that won't lean right, back. Right. They bought the dentrix from you. And, and they go, and I'll never forget, do you remember John Miles who uh, took Dentsply public with uh, the call signal was X-ray. Uh, he was the biggest man in dentistry. Yeah. Big, big man. He has the biggest boat on the Chesapeake Bay. It had four engines um, because people didn't realize his wife who was only like, you know, like three foot tall. She was from Puerto Rico. Yeah. And he could get in his boat in the Chesapeake Bay and 
boogie on all the way down to Puerto Rico. I mean, just the coolest man. And every time I had dinner with him, he'd always say he loved dentistry. And I and you'd always say, why? And he'd say, those are the most brand loyal son of a gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they have so many problems that if something's working, well, they're never going to try changing that. If you come in and say, hey, try this new one. It's fight. But like, would you shut up? This works. You know what doesn't work? This, this, and this. He said, he said, if it works, they just take it off their to-do list and then they go to the next thing and not working. And, and you might walk in there and, and he used to tell his rep, just go in there and ask them what's broken. And don't tell them that you know the solution because they only believe their peers. So get on Dental Town, because remember, Dental Town was five years before Facebook. We were out in 99, Facebook came out in 2004. He said, print out pages. Of, of guys like you posting and walk in there and say, well, you said you didn't like this denture re line. Uh, and so that's why we started the Townie Choice Awards because um, the, people like John Miles were saying, these guys don't care what my 1,000 reps say. You know what they care? They care what the other thousand dentists say. They're brand loyal and they're totally, and, and of course they care what their peers think because my God, dental school is four years. I mean, four years with a hundred people that were the only people in town that knew the difference in a cosine and a tangent. They all knew calculus. I mean, Joey D. I'll never forget Joey D at Creighton. We had those little TI-34 calculators and he yeah, had yeah. hooked up to a printing roll and one to a, um, uh, what was that first computer sold at Radio Shack? Um, uh, oh, the, the began with an H. What was it called? The something or other kid? He's kid. He's kid. Oh my God. And, and, and so the, they're, you know, dentists, you know, a dental medical education is about giving you the math, the applied math physics, the applied physics, chemistry, the applied chemistry, biology, and the applied biology, dentistry, healthcare, whatever. They gave you the science tools to be able to apply the, the, and these tools, I mean, you know, Galileo and Copernicus were 500 years ago. I mean, gosh darn, Pythagoras was 2,500 years ago. The, these tools aren't changing. And that's what I love about my 30 day dental MBA. I, I put it up for free on, back in the day, it was a revolution in 98, but now it's like 2020 and it still gets a couple thousand downloads um, a month on uh, really? YouTube and iTunes for free. And I, and when they send me say, by the way, you were um, actually born after that was made. Um, did it still apply? And they said, yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, so it's kind of like algebra, I mean, business, consumerism, the patient, leadership. I don't, I don't think these are fads. These are, I mean, geometry is not a 2,500 year fad. I, I don't think anybody's looking at Copernicus saying, no, I think it was a circle. I don't think it was an eclipse. Uh, you know, so a lot of this stuff is fundamental stuff and it is not going to go away and not going to change. But back to opening back up again, I'm going to say it again. If you are a DSO and you have um, 12 chairs and you have four dentists, well, I, I guarantee you could open up with half the crew because half of America, they don't care. They don't care. They don't believe it. They're young. I, I don't care if they think it's a hoax or if they think they're immune, or if they're narcissistically thinking they're invincible, or they're seeing the data that, you know, the number one cause of death with coronavirus is being 85, the next most variable is being over 75, and then it's being diabetic with heart disease, then it's being over 65, and they're sitting there saying, okay, I'm 25, I, I don't care, I'm, I'm going back to work. And um, so, so the other half, there, if you're going to wait for a vaccine, that's, you, you can't, you can't base anything on that, but this antibody testing, um, as they come, as they get tested for antibodies and they test positive for the antibodies, whether it doesn't matter if it works or it doesn't work because perception is reality. If they test positive to the antibodies and I went and got my blood tested, luckily I tested positive for everything. I mean, HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, I think, uh, I think COVID was in there, but everything was positive. And, uh, but um, no, I haven't got tested and I don't know if I'm positive, but I do know that if I got tested and I was positive for the antibodies, I would be less fearful. But will dentists, I'm sorry, will dentists be the front line in terms of checking people? Will dentists have all those testing capabilities? Because well, the smartest DSO on the block. I was so proud of their, um, of their thinking outside the box. I'm, I love my team the most 
when they do something great and I didn't have anything to do with it, I didn't even see it coming. And when I saw it, I was wowed. That's my favorite. And then you feel like you were just born to create jobs. If you're, if you're the one always writing the to-do list, it, it's kind of like when the hygienists don't want to come back. I, I mean, I mean that, that opens up a whole can of words. I mean, num number one, she has four or he has four years of college. In a hospital, he'd be a registered nurse. Here, he's a registered dental hygienist, four years of college. They know they have the same tools to read epidemiology. They know statistics. They know p-values. They know all that stuff. And if they've made a personal decision, last I checked, this is still America. If you don't want to come back, don't come back. I, I wouldn't want you to come back. And But a lot of hygienists are, are saying on Dental Town, well, what, what PPE do you recommend I, I, we should use? Well, that's, that's, now that's a teaching point for me because the last I checked, I give you money. You don't give me money. So let me get this right. So I pay you $40 an hour and then I'm supposed to figure out your PPE? Really? Well, you know what? Instead of me spending all that time figuring out your job, it'd be a shitload easier to fire your ass and go find someone that does a job. So that's the manager's dilemma. Everybody always says to me, oh yeah, how do you do it? You got a dental office, you got dental town, ortho town, hygiene town, you lecture, how do you do it? Well, I do it because I got a dozen ladies and a couple of guys that have been with me for a couple of decades and they don't ever ask me any questions or they don't, every once in a while, you know, they'll ask me, well, what do you think of this or that? And I'll say, well, first of all, it's your department, so it's your call, baby doll. Right. But if, if you're just morbidly curious what the old fat guy thinks, this is what I think. But the minute I sense that I'm paying you money and doing your job, and there's seven and a half billion people, I mean, I mean they, they got mad at Jack Wells. So they used to call him Neutron Jack because every year when he did bonuses, at the end of the year, he said, well, why am I bonusing the bottom 10%? I mean, 90% of my employees were better than you. No, I'm not giving you a bonus. In fact, for Christmas, I'm going to fire your ass because if I replace you, I got a 90% chance he'll be better than you. So mm -hmm. every year at Christmas, nine out of 10 people at GE, and it was like 300,000 employees, got a bonus and 10% were fired. And when I see all these people say, well, my hygienist asked me this, my, well, then get a new hygienist because there's a lot of unemployed hygienists. And one other thing about hygiene, wh who, which dentists are the most happy? The ones in Colorado where hygienists have legal competition, they can have independent practitioners. I don't believe that you should restrict free and fair trade. When I grew up, when you walk down the street, every third car garage, mom, dad, uncle, Henry, we're all trying to get this piece of crap, Chevy, Chrysler, Ford. Uh, what did Ford stand for? I forgot. Extra repair daily. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they were all junk. And it was all about the unions. That was all the union was for the working man. Union for the working man. Pilots and auto manufacturers. The working man doesn't have a union. Only the richest people in the Fortune 500s have unions. And all they do with those unions is make everything more expensive for the real working man, the half of America, that's never going to have a benefit, a retirement plan, or work for a union. Those boys at GM, they're not union people. The pilots aren't union people. They're mobsters shaking down the owners, and the owners are mobsters shaking down them. Then the government's the ultimate mobster, and they're shaking down both. Uh, but anyway, it was not until Japan started sending in little dots and B210s, and, and Germany started sending in little Volkswagens, and all the Americans said, oh my God, it's a car that works. And, and, and GM, when I was in high school, sold 51% of the cars. They don't even sell 30% of the cars. And they don't sell 30% of the cars because they suck. If you want to buy a car, make sure it's made in Japan or Germany, which is the only two countries I'm aware of that make a car, or go to Italy if you want a high-end Ferrari or Lamborghini or something like that. But competition is what's good. And in Colorado, if all those hygienists can just go set up their own shop, and in, and in Colorado what it is, is they say that it's all rural communities and everybody complains about affordability, availability, and they take out their dining room and they put in a little used dental chair and this is their cell phone and they can't, they don't take any insurance or anything like that. Um, it costs you a hundred dollars to go have your hair and nails done. I don't have any hair, but I imagine if I was going to go in for, I don't know, whatever I could go in for, I guess I could get a Manny Petty. Um, that hundred dollars, that that's what they charge. In fact, the girl I talked to in Colorado, 
it's a hundred dollars and it's cash. She won't take a check. She won't take a credit card. You come in there, give her a, a Benjamin or five twenties. And then if she sees something, I mean, she's got four years degree. She's a registered nurse at a hospital. She writes down a deal and says, Dr. Sorota, will you check number 30 for me? So I think that this, you know, let's make something good come out of this. Let's sit there and, and just give high, all hygienists licensed by credentials. And then if you're the manager and you're stressed out about your hygienist um, putting demands on you, well, this is the perfect time to just fire her and her bad attitude and get her ass out of there because the manager's dilemma, the reason I'm a really good manager is because I don't manage. I manage the HR process. It's kind of like a ball player. I mean, you're up in Canada, which I don't understand. You put that how, how, I don't know how you could be an endodontist and love hockey, which is the number one sport of knocking teeth out. Uh, when, I, when, when, a, when a dentist tells me they like hockey, uh, the duality of man, but, but my gosh, you, you, wouldn't, you, you just want to get the best hockey player. And, and if you got Wayne Gretzky, well, now you're not going to go down there and start telling them how to hit the puck and how to skate and all that. No, you should manage the HR process of attracting and retaining the best people. And once you got little Wayne Gretzky, it's like during this pandemic, a couple of times, my Lori and my Stacy said, well, you know, um, well, what, what do you want us to do? And I said, what do, what do you mean us? You've been here for 20 years. Nothing's changing. This is your department. Tell me what you're going to do. Yes, I know I'm the owner. I could trump you. <clears throat> and I do overrule them <clears throat> about 5% of the time is what they all will agree to. So if I say we're going right and they say they're going left, we're going left 19 out of 20 times. Um, someone asked me the other day um, about the PPE for the hygiene. What am I going to do for the hygiene? I said, th th there's another pet peeve of mine. I've never ordered hygiene supplies in my life. And I think the dentists who do it um, they're the same dentist that can't keep a hygienist. I mean, I mean, could you imagine if you, if a hygienist are picking your endophiles? Oh, oh, Dr. Sirota, I talked to the Patterson lady and we're going to switch your, I mean, I mean, come on, you're doing your job. I'm doing my job. If you don't know what profi paste to get, if you don't know what kind of mask you want to wear, if you don't know any of this stuff, I would start with a suing your hygiene school to get your money back and go on and maybe and then when you're done there stop by the unemployment place because you're fired i mean it's just a lot of when you're standing there watching an employee never make a free throw i mean they, and you see them stay on dental offices for years and years and years so for me the employee turnover is very very high in the first year but if you make it and you're good and you're internally driven and you know how to make decisions. And the other thing about personality is every time I see you, I want to see the same person. So mm -hmm. I don't want you up one day, down the other, happy, sad. I want to see the same person every day. Every time I see you, I want the same person. It's your department. It's your responsibility. And I want to see what you're doing. And if you want me to give you money to do your job, then I pick the wrong player and just like a big pro football team that spent a lot of money on a star player and after a year said, we're going to cut our losses now and they fire him and get another one. So I want lots of turnover in year one. And then, and then on, if you're a 30 year old company, you better have a dozen employees that have been there 20 years or then it's you. So when I go see a 30 year old dental office and the longest any employee has been there a year, it's the dentist. And then when I go in there and I see a 30 year old dental office and there's a bunch of old mother hens that have been in there a couple of decades. And then the young girl's like, I don't like this place. Well, it's you. And, yeah. and, and there's not right or wrong. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to country music all day. I mean, yeah. there's nothing wrong with country music, but I like, I like real music and all real music was released in the seventies. There's been no good music after the year 2000. And if you think someone falling down a stairway with a guitar in their hand, you know, when we were little, they had lyrics. So they turned the instruments down because they had words with meanings. You listen to stuff, my boys, you can't even hear the lyrics because they're so horrible and meaningless that the instruments are up real high and it's all noisy and all that stuff. So, so it's not what I'm getting at. It's not right or wrong. It's just your preference. And how do you, know, sir, how do you like looking now? You've got dental town in Spain, Portugal, Germany. Um, you obviously have to deal with those countries. What's your take on all of this impacting upon them? How do you see their uh, 
basically dentistry as a profession being altered in those countries uh, as a result of all of this? Well, I think, um, let me let me pick on Canada first because you're <laughs> hanging fruit right to the north. I think one of the most interesting things that's going to come out of this is when I post a PDF of an article, trust me, I've read the article. I've con I've found the contact. I want to say that he's a member of Dental Town. I and then when I post it, I share that with the person. Like I have a lot of people emailing back and forth that are epidemiologists from Wuhan. How I'm I emailing the dean of the dental school of Wuhan, China. How cool is that? And I've lectured in all those places in Italy, and I got um, uh, Tiziana Capri telling me what's going on. So. So I, I like the community. Well, I think the most interesting thing that's happened is, is um, everyone knows the big killers of cancer and, and they know that cars eat 40,000 years, suicide, all that. Yeah. But, I've, um, but they're all noticing that the morbidity and mortality weekly reports from the CDC has been going down to this whole pandemic. And at first they said, well, they're not driving and the traffic drop 40%, that eats 40,000 a year. So if traffic's down 40, I mean, that, that, there's 15,000 saved lives. And then they kept diving into it and said, no, no, something else is going on. It's going lower and lower and lower. See, healthcare's little dark secret that no one wants to talk about is the hospital system kills 100,000 people a year minimum. And nobody really knows how many die because the thing about lawyers is they always say, well, you know, we like to settle everything out of court. America has a million attorneys and 99% of all the lawsuits are settled out of court. So what that means is there's no transparency. So you don't know what's going on. And if I make a mistake and I kill you and my patient and my malpractice pays and everybody, part of receiving this money is I did nothing wrong and it's a hush hush. Well, you, you, it, you can hide that stuff, but you can't hide people not showing up at the morgue, going to the cemetery, getting lowered underground. And the first thing that's obvious is these 5,000 cardiovascular surgeons who always tell yeah, you need a stent, Ken. You need a stent here and a stent here. Well, they're not telling you how many people die during that procedure. So all these socialized medicines where they're all saying, yeah, you should get free healthcare and free prescriptions. Dude, Google polyphagia. By the time you're on five prescriptions, you're not going to live very long. And now that people aren't going out to go to their doctors to get their prescription, to get their little procedures, the death rate is coming down. So a lot of people who have been saying for years, well, of course you don't want free prescriptions. Why the hell would you want free prescriptions? You, they, this person has to have skin in the game. And this is something that this is something that really good people with big hearts and very lovable and adorable um, believe fiercely. Just like my two oldest sisters are Catholic nuns and they believe that stuff fiercely and they're never going to change your mind. And I accept that. But the, but the truth of the matter is data. You can't deny data. And giving someone free prescriptions and free surgeries and free health care without compensating for exactly 100 to 300,000 lost souls a year is going to become apparent really, really quick. And you could um, get rid of all the fraud in hospitals and healthcare. Imagine this. Imagine if everything in healthcare had a 10% copay. What, what's wrong with that? And people say, well, well, yeah, but she needs a hip and that's 50,000. Dude, an F-150 pickup truck is 50,000. The average American buys 13 new cars in their lifetime between the ages of 16 and 76. And that's according to Blue Book, Kelly Blue Book, USA Today, median average car price, 33,000. Why can they have no problem buying a $33,000 house, but a $33,000 hysterectomy? Oh, it can't, it's, not, it's not me. My neighbor's got to buy me a new truck. And then they buy a house for 100, 200, 300. But when the human has skin in the game, he looks at the price. I always hear my Canadian friends say, well, I went in the hospital and had a bypass and I didn't even get a bill. Well, so you're saying to economists that you should throw away price? That price doesn't matter? That price doesn't have a very elastic effect on demand? Because in America, if, if your bypass, if your artificial hip was $30,000, and there was a 10% co-payment, so your co-payment was 3000 And you looked around and said, well, I can go to Georgia and get it for 20000 Or I can go all the way to Alaska and get it for fifteen. 
then, then they would be shopping on price. There would be almost no fraud and they would consume less healthcare. And if they would consume less prescriptions and less healthcare, they're going to live longer. And when Bernie comes out and says, free college and free healthcare, every epidemiologist I know says, well, then why don't you just say you don't even need a prescription? Why don't, why don't you just say Walgreens is a candy store and go in there and eat what you want? Because that's what's going to happen in the end. They're going to go to enough doctors till they find what they want and they're going to get enough pills, but it's a very expensive way for grandma to kill herself by eating all these prescriptions. So when we look at the, the world again, we're going to go back to three people. One has no phone, no internet. One has a cell phone, but no internet. And one's got a smartphone. The smartphone people are rich. And the smartphone people, the only health, the only wealth is health. So they've been bidding up the price of the final days is what you would expect. If you have 30,000 days of life, the first one ain't worth nothing. But my God, the last hundred's worth a lot. And it was the Mayo brothers who realized, once you tell grandma she's going down, She'll sell her farm, her house, her pension. She wants to buy another day. And Milton Friedman called it the little blue pill. Here's the little blue pill. All these people saying we spend too much money on healthcare. And he says, all right, well, here's the deal. Ken, you're gonna die tonight. But if you take this little pill from Howie, you ain't gonna die. Ken Sirota, how much money would you give me for this pill? Everything I have. I know. So they've been bidding up the price. Healthcare was 1% of GDP in 1900. By 2000, it was 14%. It's all the way up to 70%. So as people get richer and richer and richer, they're going to bid up the price of saving their tooth. Go to any woman in Canada, any woman you find on the street and say, hey, how much money would I have to give you to pull your front tooth and you could never replace it the rest of your life? She's like, well, I, uh, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. What about for a million bucks? What, what would she say? Would she pull her front tooth and go toothless for a million bucks? It might be a percentage, but the vast majority would not do that. Yeah, because then they're always going to be accused of being from America, and they're going to say, are you from the United States? <laughs> 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 so the, the, bottom, the bottom line is that it's, it's the ultimate luxury item is I'm not going to die today. That's why I'm not, that's why I'm not going back to work. I'm not going to have a million bucks and go risk my life for no apparent reason. But if I was 25 and, you know, it could be a whole different one. My, my four boys, oh, my God. And, and, and they, they go out for the craziest things just for no reason at all. They're just driving around doing that. So, so I believe that half of the richest people in, uh, in the rich, developed, most developed 20 countries, they're not worried about this at all because it's age their age group, their risk ability. Um, you know, um, I think it's funny. Like my mom, there's a class example of how insane risk is. She is 82 years old and is fearless about the virus. They said to wear a mask and she says, well, I've worn a mask my whole life. And she pulls out her scapula. Have you, you know what a scapula is? Do you know any Catholic? Yeah, 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 yeah. A scapula, you wear a scapula and you're protected by the Virgin Mary. So my mom's not wearing a mask, but she always wears a scapula, but she doesn't like to fly because she doesn't want to die. And I'm like, mom, no, no one died on Southwest Airlines last year. One person died on Southwest Airlines to date and a little piece of the engine flew off, hit the window, sucked the guy's head, you know, out the window, killed him. And all I did is said, okay, I don't want a window seat. I just moved to the aisle. No, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm all fine. But my mom's afraid of an airplane but not getting in a car that eats 40,000 people. She's not afraid of a coronavirus because she wears a Catholic scapula. And uh, so, so risk is risk reward is very bizarre. Why do you get on the interstate, uh, but you're 25 and you're afraid to go sit at a restaurant or a movie theater during a pandemic? So we all do risk differently. And for New York City, the largest city in the United States, um, it's, um, it's the largest city in the United States and Canada, but it's not, is it larger than Mexico City? Uh, I think so, if you look at the entire tri-state area, but Mexico City is, depending on what happens, I think it's 30 million people if you bring them all in for work and whatever. Uh, New York is probably what, 22, 25 million? Yeah, so Mexico City is the biggest one, but, but New York City, if, the, my favorite stat about New York City is that if the whole world lived at the density of Manhattan, we would all be able to live on New Zealand. And then there's this area in Shanghai 
that if the whole world lived at that density, we would all live on just the Northern Ireland of, um, of uh, New Zealand, and we wouldn't even have to go to the Southern Island where they did Lord of the Rings. So that density, I mean, it's so dense. And then they're trying to say, well, their policies from New York City apply to Kansas. I'm in Arizona. I got four hours of a desert, 360 degrees. I, 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 there, there's no subways. I'm in the desert. It's 100 degrees outside. It's not going to be the same everywhere. So I believe that, you know, we're not allowing states to do what they want. Those states are bigger than countries. I mean, come on. It's the third most populous state. California is the same as Canada. Arizona is the same as Denmark or Sweden or Norway. So I think let these countries try different things. And, um, and, and you know, it, it's, it's just going to do what it's saying. We don't know what it's going to do. And if you, um, um, but as the antibody test runs over, here's what I've, I, I've seen. There are people testing positive antibodies. People are donating their plasma and they're, they're already starting to treat people with these antibodies to some success. And I'm hearing about that right here in my backyard in the Navajo Indian Reservation where some 70 Navajos have already died. And I don't know what's going on there. So sad. I assume it's all because they left the Grand Canyon open. And every time I've been to the Grand Canyon, there's nobody from North America there. They're all from Asia and Europe. And, 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 and by the way, I had a dental assistant for 30 years. My Jan. Never went to Grand Canyon. I mean, you know, just lived, lived here. I mean, she just always had something she'd rather do that day. And then when you go to the Grand Canyon, there's not one person there from Arizona. They're all from, you know, Germany, Japan, China. Um, so it's a tourist trap, but I don't know if the tourists are getting in there or what, whatever, but um, they, uh, they got hit hard. Um, but, um, but again, it's going to be like a bad flu season so far. Uh, is this going to go way worse than the worst flu season we've had? Um, you know, going back to uh, – uh, you're, I, no one knows, but. So what would your message be to dentists around the world right now in terms of expectations as it relates to how their practices are going to reopen in regard to practices based solely on elective dentistry or rehabilitative transdis transdisciplinary dentistry? Um, you know, we're suddenly in an era, like granted, there are going to be fluctuations and differences in terms of uh, the percentages of people who are positive, the incidence of death. If you're a dentist anywhere in the world today, you're still practicing dentistry, doesn't matter where it is, whether you're putting in fillings, cleaning teeth, or using ExoCAD to design the next reconstruction. What's your take home message? Well, I am, um, man, what does a guy have to do to get a drink around this place? <laughs> the help, the help around here, Ken, I swear to God. Um, here, here's what I would do if I was a baby how if I was in the corona uh, class by the way I graduated eighty seven thousand dollars of student loans with you've just sat for inflation from 1987 to 2020 it, it's about two hundred fifty thousand dollars because my dad was um, a product of his time uh, he paid for my sister's college but I was a boy and so you know he told me if I um if he paid for my college I wouldn't be a man and I would go to Creighton and I would just do drugs and chase women so I went to Creighton University and had to buy weed with student loan money. That was so embarrassing to be taking out money from the government to buy weed. But um, I want to tell my fellow Americans I paid back all those student loans. But here's what I would do. I would come out and I would get 500 square feet and I'd build two operatories. And half of America doesn't even care. They don't care about any of this stuff. And, you, and if you don't care, and I know... 70% of Arizona doesn't even blink an eye at any of this crap. So I would open up two operatories and um, the hygienists, I think they should be rolled to independent practitioner because I know all three publicly traded dental offices do not have them. And all the models in America, your, your Heartland, it could get bought by a Canadian teacher's plan who then sold it to KKR, but NASDAQ wasn't knocking on their door. And, and they're not, they're not profitable enough. Same thing with, with um, gosh darn uh, Bob Fontana. Nice guy, love him. He's a hell of a businessman, but he can't go public. Stephen Thorne, he can't go public. If they could go public, they would. When they tell you, well, you know, actually I don't want to go public. <laughs> so you're telling me you don't want to just 
sell out all your paper for cash tonight and have it liquid. Oh no, they've always got some reason. But there are three publicly traded. Um, you got Daryl Holmes in Australia with um, Pacific Dental. Um, you got Alex Abrams with um, One Three Hundred Smiles. Um, you got uh, uh, Q and in Singapore. And I I've, I've seen their hundred practices with no debt, cash flowing, profit, where they grow their stores from profit, not debt, borrowed money and more debt. And they all got rid of the hygienists on their early prototypes. I don't think one of them made it to ten offices keeping hygiene and i'll tell you why it has nothing to do with the hygienist when you come in for a new patient exam it's all special how you doing ken how's the wife how's the dog how's the car and they spend about 15 minutes with you and then they convert that converts your treatment plan to being done and then i can see every six months till the end of time and you don't ever convert on anything else so what they did is they said here's what happens when you come in for a new patient the $20 an hour assistant sets up the room, goes and gets the new patient, comes back and takes the, the full set of x-rays and pano or whatever you do. And then the doc comes in and he measures the gums, the assistant records, and he looks and does the exam. And then he sets you up in, with the intro camera and he explains it all to you. And then your new patient exam treatment plan acceptance, case acceptance rate is real high. Then when you come in every six months, the hygienist on her hour appointment for a deal, she has to wait 10 minutes for the doctor. So she's done. So she's been waiting 10 minutes for Ken. Ken's like, damn it, I'm in the middle of a root canal. I got my scope on, on magnification, 2 million and eight. I'm about to reattach the nerve to the inferior alveolar nerve. And now I got to go do a hygiene check. So you put everything down, you run over there, you spend about four minutes in the room and you say, yeah, Ken, you got to, you need an MO here and a DO there and an MO and a DO. And then you're gone. And then they just walk out the front door. So what they did is they, when they looked at their overhead, you just say labor is 25%. Well, of that 25%, 10 cents on the dollar just went to the hygienist. They said, well, there's 10 cents a cost. We're gonna take it right out because here's what we're gonna do. We don't want a $40 an hour hygienist setting up a room when a $20 an hour assistant can do it. We don't want a $40 an hour hygienist walking out to the waiting room to see the patient and take bite wings when a $20 an hour person can do it. I mean, that, that's just obvious. So then, and then when the hygienist needs to probe, now the $40 hygienist got to get a $20 an hour assistant. Now you got $60 in the room and that's all the insurance is going to pay you for the whole damn cleaning is 60 bucks. I got, I got the whole fee for the cleaning in labor right now. And if you walk by the room, if you even knew what was going on, you should just like open the closet door and throw up. You should just be sick. And then when she's done with that, it's about 10 till I need to get a hygiene check. Now she's going to go wait 10 minutes of doing nothing. And then you're going to come in there and do four minutes and it converts to nothing. Here's what they did. They said, we're getting rid of the hygienist the $20 hour assistant, seat up the room, seat the patient, take the x-rays. Doctor comes in, he does the probe, and then the assistant records, and then he scales. And it takes you 10 minutes to scale. And while you're scaling for 15 minutes, I mean, what, what do you think is gonna find a better exam? Me going in there with a mirror and explore and blowing some air and then leaving? Or probing six points on every tooth and then scaling them all? And then I'm in there 15 minutes and I'm showing you this. I keep stopping. I'm finding stuff. I'm showing you. And then when I'm done, I leave and the assistant does the profi, the polish, the floss, the fluoride treatment. But it's, but we're not even talking money yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, hygiene is not even 25% of the revenue. 75% is the dentistry. You leave and you go up front and you convert and you say, well, yeah, I want to get that, that filling done. And so they took out the hygienist to increase the amount of time the dentist is in the room so that we don't have recall exam revenue, we have new patient exam revenue, and that's why they're debt free, that's why they have 100 offices, that's why they're publicly traded. You know, you know, what, you know what the big DSOs in America do? They think they're geniuses, here's what they do. They go raise a million dollars, they go raise $10 million and buy 10 offices at a million and say, oh my God, we went from zero to 10 million. But that old, my favorite guy on, on Shark Tank, the, the smartest guy on Shark Tank, obviously it's the bold guy. It's always the bold guy. <laughs> Mr. Wonderful. And Mr. Wonderful would say, um, um, okay, I'm going to give you a million dollars. I'm going to get my money back. Oh, well, I'm just going to come back next week and ask for another million and mm -hmm. buy another office. Then my growth has gone from a million to two million. And right. Mr. Wonderful would say, how am I going to get my money back? Well, actually, you're not. I'm just going to come every week 
and, and get another million dollars. And then when I finally reach a billion in sales on my statement of income, well, if you look at my balance sheet, my income equals my debt. So by the time they get to a billion dollar company, they got a billion dollars of debt. And Mr. Wonderful would look at any of America's DSOs and say, you're dead to me. You're dead. And the only people who believe their bullshit, I, I don't know who believes their bullshit, but, but I got 40,000 people that follow me on LinkedIn, and that's a lot of Wall Street boys. And for years, they keep saying to me, man, I'm looking at this deal. I, I don't get it. And I'm like, all right, well, what do you get? And they start going, on, all right, well, that, that, that's what you're looking at. And, that, and then three years ago, East West Bank was the third largest lender in the DSO space, and they redlined the whole space. They said, this is a joke. This is a joke. You know, the Canadian, you know the Canadian uh, DSOs, the one, two, three, Dennis, Dental Corps. Does that ring a bell with you at all? Well, I don't want to say any names because I don't want to get sued by Dental Corps, but I know Dental Lab in um, in um, Ontario that just got a stop payment on his damn check. He's like, holy shit. Because they reach out to me and they're like, okay, they just put a stop payment on check. I said, dude, finest dental, they locked the doors. They're private equity guys. I, I, I stopped paying my bills when this thing broke out. I, and, and I didn't know what was going on until I knew what was going on. It's like, well, I'm not going to pay my, my light bill. I mean, Phoenix isn't going to kick me out of my house. So, so right now, cash is king. Yep. Warren Buffett's not even buying into this market yet. He, I, and the war, and let, let me just talk about that one, one second for that because I have a long history with Warren Buffett. I went to Creighton in 1980. And after he lectured <laughs> for 10 points in Business 101, we were supposed to write up what we thought. And let me tell you how dumb I was. Mm -hmm. I was all caught up in the Nifty 50. And remember the, the internet era from 94 to 2000? <clears throat> it was the Wintel, Windows and Intel, Cisco and Dell. And Michael Dell's dad was an orthodontist. I got to Yeah, meet. an orthodontist, right. Yeah, and, and, then, and then that popped, and now the, it's the Fang, it's the Facebook, Amazon, blah, blah. Well, at the time, my, my first love affair was this Nifty 50. And here comes this old man, and, you know, he was old. Hell, he was old in 1980. I can't believe he's still alive. He was a grandpa then. And, and he's giving his presentation and all this stuff. And I said, well, well, what about the Nifty 50? I mean, can we talk about something relative, you know? Can we, you know, move this along a little bit? What are you liking? Kodak, Polaroid, what what would you... What are you liking? A Xerox? He goes, I don't own any of those. And I just look at him like, are you just dumber than a rock? And he says, he goes, if you can't take a five by seven index card and explain to me what you do and how you make money, I'm not interested. And I don't know anything about Xerox and Canon and Kodak and Nifty 50. And, and I, and so I told my instructor that this was a waste of my time this guy's dumber than a rock. Now I'm old enough to realize that I should have quit Creighton, taken one year's of tuition, bought Berkshire Hathaway, and then became a you know cook at Circle K for uh, or Taco Bell for the rest of my life. But but the bottom line is Warren Buffett's still not buying this. But he taught me one thing. He taught me his Buffett index, right? Where he said, okay, here's the Wilshire 5,000. Here's all publicly traded stocks in a country. And that needs to be less than the entire country's one year output of their GDP. So if your GDP is $1, all the stocks added up better be less than a dollar. In fact, it should be under 75 cents. And historically, whenever it gets over a dollar to a dollar 10 or whatever, it comes down. Well, you know what? After all the stock markets crashing so far, guess where it's at today? It's still a buck 25. Warren Buffett's still not buying, and he wasn't buying before the pandemic. He was sitting on $125,000, $125 billion in cash before anybody even knew what SARS-2 was. And so this market is crazy. You were asking earlier, would Henry Schein consider buying a Heartland Dental? Well, first of all, those big guys aren't even, there's they're, they're, they're so much administrative cost. When you're paying a headquarters fee, of 17 cents on the dollar my god your labor is 25 your lab is under 10 your supplies are six labor labor or lab and supplies is 16 and headquarters needs 17 are you out of your mind no wall street wall street brokers look at this like but why does private equity love them because private equity i mean the federal reserve is at cash basically free so those guys can just get unlimited funds 
Uh, so that's a Federal Reserve issue, and that that's insane, and that's a whole other story. But the bottom line is, right now with the with the Buffett indicator above one, and it's 125 percent. No, I wouldn't get into this market until the Buffett indicator was at least down to 0.75. When the Wilshire total index is only worth 75 percent of the GDP. It's a buy, but your GDP is contracting. You just laid off 30 million people just lost their job so that grandma in the nursing home won't get sick. I mean, this is just, this gets crazier by the minute. So when we got invaded by Japanese at Pearl Harbor and Nazi Germany, we didn't blink an eye at rounding up 6 million men and throwing them overseas and 380,000 didn't come back alive. But now that it's grandma, she's like, well, yeah, round up those 30 million kids and throw their jobs away because we got to save grandma's life. It used to be the country says, we got a hell of a lot more people than we do a country and we'll throw 6 million boys away to save our country. Now it's like, well, now we're going to throw the country away to save everybody, uh, to save grandma. And, uh, and it's, it's not playing well at all in Arizona and Texas and Kansas. It doesn't even play well with my mother. My mother's 82. And if you say, well, mom, what if you died? And she says, well, I, I've been wanting to see your father again since 1999. She don't care. I mean, this works either way for her. Uh, she's alive. She gets to see me and her grandkids. And if she dies, she gets to see dad. She don't even care. But so what I would do if I was a young kid, I would do this. I don't think it's a game of, it, for half of America, nothing's changed. So you could go buy a practice, and this is a really good time to buy a practice because all the buyers have gone away. The brokers are still doing deals. I talked to, uh, I, you know who my uh, uh, Canadian deep throat is, who I talk to in the yeah. parking lot garage about all things? Um, you know Timothy Brown? Of course, Roy. Right. With ROI. I mean, yeah. the, guy, the guy knows a lot of, so much data. And the bottom line is, I, I called him, uh, um, uh, I don't know, once a week. And he says there and says, uh, yeah, he can sell you practice today. Well, what's happening? Well, the dentists that are selling, they delisted because they, they're just scared. And then the people buying are, 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 are whatever. But all I know is this, half of America, nothing changed. The other half, it's no longer going to be a game of volume. Instead of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, it's going to be the American Academy of Disease Control Dentistry. And they're going to be scared until they get a vaccine. That could be two years to never. I'm, they've been chasing a, vi a vaccine for the government. How can you and I have spent our whole life in dentistry under a virus? HIV. It's killed 36 million people in 40 years. They Remember they told us when I was in dental school, I mean, I went to a great dental school that the vaccine for P. gingivalis was around the corner and the vaccine for dental decay, streptococcus mutans, around the corner. And with HIV, the way it's killing, you'll see that within a year. Ken, that was 40 years ago. Yep. Can you give me an update on the dental decay vaccine, the periodontal disease vaccine, the common cold vaccine? Uh, I'm, sure it'll, I'm sure you'll get it in Toronto before I will here in Hillbilly, Arizona. But how, what's the update on the cavity, gum disease, common cold vaccine? There was a lot of work being done at Harvard. They wanted to do uh, replacement therapy with strep mutans. They were going to uh, see if they could uh, put strep mutans that would supersede the strep mutans in the mouth. The only difference is it was non-karyogenic. Um, uh, the guy that was working on it was a fellow named uh, Hillman. And he got grant money from a major pharmaceutical company here in Canada. Uh, he came up and visited one time. We went for dinner, uh, and for sure, he told 18 months down the road, guaranteed, right? Uh, I, I don't remember the specifics of it, but they were going to replace the strep mutans in kids with this whatever it was, and uh, it's 2020. This had to be early 80s, right? I remember that guy well, and I remember the first time I lectured in New Delhi, um, first time I lectured in um, um, Hong Kong, the first time I had dinner with the president of the Chinese Dell. So you know what they, you know what they used to tell me in the 90s? 
in the 90s and the early 2000s, well, you know, we over here in India, China, Indonesia, Cambodia, Malaysia, Brazil, I've lectured in 50 countries. I said, well, we analyze the U.S. healthcare system for dentistry, where you have a dentist for every 2,000 people, and for your 325 million, it costs about 120 billion. So we extrapolate that to India, China, Malaysia. So we realize that for just 1% of that cost, we could just get the vaccine. So we got, we started the Center for Dental Decay Vaccine, and we got the 20 smartest epidemiologists in all of India. And we're, we're, about, we're about two or three years away from the vaccine. Okay, that was 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And they've been saying this about the coronavirus, the rhinovirus, the dental decay. So when, when you tell people, and they always, they're, they're, they're blindsided by influenza where you've had the most luck. But with influenza, I mean, the CDC just reported yesterday, influenza vaccines um, for each vaccine runs between 17 and 71% effectiveness. So for influenza, the best they ever got ever was 71%. And they never, ever got a coronavirus one time in their life. And I bet you my grandkids will have kids before they vaccinate dental decay and P. gingivalis and all that stuff. So, so what I would do, again, 50%, nothing changed. You just got to focus on your market, just like the AACD people. I mean, I don't like doing the AACD cases um, because, um, I don't know, I'm just, I, I'm, a, I'm a blood and guts guy. I like blood. I like oral surgery, implants, root canals. I, I don't even like um, single tooth endos. I wish they would pass a law to let the dental assistants do all the all the incisors and canines. Um, uh, that's a joke, Ken. I'm just trying to. Yeah, no, you're, you're, I'm just trying to trigger you. But the you're get death threats, Art. I like the blood and gut stuff. I don't like, you know, if I had a practice limited to bleaching, bonding, and veneers, I'd probably go into another line of work. Um, you know, um, but uh, so so half of America, nothing changed. The other half, the most value isn't that you're a cosmetic dentist or have an MAGD or a diplomat or any of that bullshit. It's disease control. They're scared. And they're going to be scared until we get a vaccine, which may never happen. Or they're going to be scared until they test positive to the antibodies, which that may happen very quickly. Because as soon as they get a little piece of air says, yeah, you test positive, then they're not going to be afraid. And whether that's rational or not, it doesn't matter. So what I would do is I would, um, it's no longer, for that half the crowd, it's no longer game volume. So let's talk about volume discounts. If I buy one bottle of water from you, I pay a dollar. If Walmart buys a million bottles of water from Pepsi or Coke, they pay 50 cents, right? So it's a game of volume. So I, when I got out of school, a root canal was a thousand, a crown was a thousand. I would submit it to Ed Judd at Delta Dental of Arizona, and they would just say, look, here's our deal. We'll pay 100% for clean exam and x-rays, 80% on endo and fillings, and only half on crown centers partials. I submit my own fees. They paid. Everything was great. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. And then over the years, they said, you know what? We, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, we're just going to tell you the fees because they were getting pressure because a lot of dentists in South Phoenix want to know, well, why, why do we only get 600 for a crown? But if you're in Scottsdale, you get, a, you know, you get 1200 for a crown. And it, it, it didn't make any sense because the most white communities were all getting 1000 to a 1500 for a crown at Root Canal. And the most black, brown, Native American, Indian, anything um, other than um, European was getting half that amount. And they were getting a lot of flack like they should be because that's how the system ended up working. It wasn't intentional design, but that was the, uh, the, the outcome. And, and, they were, and they had that system because they wanted to please everyone and you can't. So, so now it went to a PPO where they just said, hey, if you're in Arizona, here's our fee schedule. So I do one crown for a thousand, but if I sign up for this PPO, if I sign up for United, um, whatever, um, I only get 650. Well, that's in a game of volume. That makes sense. I'd rather have, I'd rather do 10 crowns for 650 than one crown for a thousand. Makes totally sense. But that was pre coronavirus. So now I'm going to come in the room and now we're back to Sonic driving. The waiting room is out in the parking lot. And then you're gonna have to teledentistry and you don't need to, why, why do you need all this teledentistry software? You don't have a freaking iPhone. You can't use your own phone. So, you know, FaceTime, I FaceTime my 82 year old mother. So, so they FaceTime me and you can ask them 
questions and they're all stupid. It's just to make you feel good. Like you're supposed to say, well, do you have a temperature? Even though there was a study published that uh, in a Boston uh, place um, of everybody being treated with COVID-19, only 1% had a fever. Another study, less than half had a fever. But you just say your fever, you do the, because perception is reality and you want them to feel like that you're taking this serious. You're slowing down. There's no one in the waiting room. You come in. You walk in there. Yeah, I would have the air purifier filter because you you didn't have it pre-COVID. You have it post-COVID. They see a change. Uh, they used to have that little um, shop vac five-inch deal for more airflow. Uh, maybe you can close the room and put a little fan in the window and call it a negative air pressure room. Again, it's mostly more shit, bullshit, pile higher and deeper. But you're but you're gonna do this because. You got government agencies, and even though they've been incompetent for your entire life, now we're supposed to raise their level of competency and listen to their idiocy a little more. But just make everybody feel a little safer. And we're going to go in there, and we're going to wear the PPE, and we're going to wear the face mask, and we're going to we're going to take everything a lot simpler. Because remember, we've been doing universal precautions my whole life. So I remember back in 1980. Now, now Ken, when I tell you this, you're not going to. But it's absolutely true. When I got here in 1987, my favorite dentist from the Scottsdale Study Club, who wore this big old curly wig, and his, his cuspidor was his ashtray. And he had a thousand cigarette buds in his ashtray. <laughs> and all of his patients would never go anywhere else because where can you go to the dentist and smoke these days? And yeah. every one of them, he was probably 80, and all of his patients were 70 or 60. And I thought the most hilarious thing, I was like 24, and I'll never forget him telling me about how and this lady left the room and says, my God, is she gorgeous or what? And this lady was like 70 with liver spots and, and had some flower dress on, and I just thought to myself, you know, this is the twilight zone. But the point is, he was the only smoking dentist in Scottsdale, and he was a very rich, well-to-do man because all them rich, retired widows in Scottsdale, they knew that was the last place you'd go and smoke. But the bottom line is, because of HIV, we were supposed to wear masks and gloves, and he, he, he didn't want to do it. And, and, then, and then, the, then they eventually put so much downward pressures, they took out our cuspidors, and then the, the water lines coming in from the city. The, um, I flunked a colony for nation you know the, the the benko lady would take samples anyway my benko rep came back and said you know we're in the desert howie it's 120 degrees outside and i can't keep your water lines low enough we need to we need to move a bottle of water in the room it'll be an air conditioner remember with water every time you raise the temperature 10 degrees life grows twice as fast so when you go from 60 to 70, twice fast, 70 to 80, twice again, uh, 80 to 90. So when you're at Phoenix and it's 120 degrees outside, you basically can't kill everything in the damn water line. So all these incremental improvements, I'd like to remind people that after SARS-1, those aeroplanes aren't recirculating the air. They got rid of that a decade ago. That, that air goes outside. Um, but um, so... All these incremental permits, but you remember back in the day when Dennis said, hey, I'm an American. I'm not treating that AIDS guy. I have my independent, I'm an American. I don't know how, I can do whatever I want. And what did the Supreme Court tell him? You're gonna treat that guy under the American Disabilities Act or you're gonna turn in your driver's license. Well, now here it is 40 years later and I already know dentists that aren't gonna treat a COVID patient. I know hygienists that aren't gonna treat a COVID patient. And we've, I've already seen this rodeo. The funniest thing was, remember when AIDS came out and everybody's like, well, when that man with AIDS goes and drinks out of the glass at Denny's, they didn't know how to clave that glass. They put it in a dishwasher. And I'm not going to, so, and now they're spraying down Amazon. They're spraying Windex on their Amazon packages. I mean, if your wife came home with chlamydia, would you ask her if she handled an Amazon package or your brother's package? I mean, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's just complete insanity. And, and that's what I love about being old. I really love being old because, you know, some of these people, you know, this is the first time they've ever seen a giraffe and you can see it in their face. They ain't never seen a giraffe before. I've been looking at viruses, HIV since high school, 1980. Kimberly Bergalis, when that broke out, do you realize, Ken, that when I opened my dental office in 87 for 10 years, I knew if you were over 80, because only the over 80 crowd would ask the question, oh, 
Dr. Ferran, uh, do you do you sterilize your your hand pieces? You might say, well, Frank, of course I sterilize my hand piece. Why would you ask? Well, I'm concerned about AIDS. I'd say, well, Frank, AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease. And I'd open up my drawer and I'd pull out a condom and say, Frank, if you want me to wear a condom during this crown today, you have to put it on. That's my policy. If you put it on, I'll wear it. And, you know, so, you know, and now you're going to catch coronavirus from your shoelaces and, you know, you're going to get it from an Amazon package. And so it's going to be, you know, I'm completely convinced that probably half the planet is batshit crazy. And it just is what it is. For, uh, yeah. Yeah. So right, I got, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm going to go in a sec because I got some preparation to do for tomorrow. But I'm going to leave you with a thought. And it's 1 800 DNT Town. 1 800 DEN Town? DNT Town. 1 800 DNT Town. And what is that? It's how people get helped uh, at this point in time with moving forward in a dental world that will change by default or by design. So it's 1-800-DNT-DENTAL, T-O-W-N. So it's a 1-800 it's a number for people who do not know what to do next. And uh, I'm, uh, okay, so it's 1-800-D one one like David, N like Norman, T like Tom, okay, T-O-W-N. Okay. One ringy dingy. <laughs> well, just make it a website for now. <laughs> oh, um, okay. So I, I called the number that it hung up. Is it um yeah, there's I just came up with it in my head while we were talking. It just oh. just it's like it's for you. I give you the IP. Go for it. Have fun. Oh, you mean, where do you, well, you know what? Just download the Dental Town app. Um, that, that, there's 70,000 Americans download the Dental Town app. And I'll tell you why you need to go around the Dental Town app. Because, you know what? Look, look, I just want to get, explain U.S. news for a second. You know, you got people yeah, ask, why is yeah. Fox News and why is CNN? Why they, because if you go into church and you say some things, they'll say, hey, man. And if you say other things, they'll say, no, man, get, get the hell out of here. Well, that feedback is what balkanites their message. And it's the same thing in news media. Some news media is if you, if you say this, they'll be happy. And if you say the opposite, they'll get mad. So the, the, these news stations didn't do this on purpose. They just try, they're just, they're just pandering to their crowd. So the bottom line is what, why you need dental town is because I see what you do on social media. And by the way, I stopped posting on Facebook. I have 300,000 followers and, and after the pandemic, I, I can't do Facebook and dental town. So I, I, I haven't posted one time on um, facebook.com forward slash Howard Ferran. Um, I, I stopped doing that. I'm still doing <coughs> LinkedIn, Twitter, and um, Instagram. LinkedIn. Winner and Instagram, so I still do Instagram, but those are the younger days. Um, <clears throat> if you have erectile dysfunction and you're a dentist, you're on Facebook. If you don't have erectile dysfunction and you're a dentist, you're on Instagram. So that's the easiest way to tell. When <laughs> AOL, you don't have to ask if they have ED. They do. Uh, if they didn't, they'd have a Gmail account. But the, the reason you need Dental Town so badly is <clears throat> because on your LIFO, going to church, your little group of people, everybody is preaching to the choir and people get so upset and you can just see the newbies on dental town. They'll get on there and they'll give a speech that they always do in front of their friends at the fishing boat. Then someone else says, dude, you're so full of shit. Look at these three studies. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're more wrong. And then I get the email. I get the report abuse. I get the, can you believe what he said? And I'm like, dude, what is wrong with you? He's a doctor and he disagrees with you, and your panties are all tied up in a knot. I call myself dentistry uncensored, and the reason I don't have thick skin, like people always say, well, how come you don't care what people think? It's because you have to earn that from me. I mean, there's 110 billion humans that lived and died before I didn't. We won't even know their names. There's 8 billion humans alive today. You're never gonna meet 99% of them. So when little Charlie Brown, the dentist down the street says, 
he thinks that you're completely wrong and he doesn't agree. Well, first of all, I didn't know your name, just like I didn't know the 110 billion, the other 8 billion. And if I'm even gonna listen to you, tell me why. And then if you can sell me, I think it's the luckiest position in the world because I opened up my own magazine because I'm the only person that would publish my own articles, you know, just like I would never join a country club because I would never go to a country club that would accept me as a member. And every decent dental magazine said, no, I can't publish that. What are you crazy? And I'm like, yes, I'm completely freaking crazy. So I got my own magazine and, and guess why I always get the first column. Guess why mine comes first? No idea. Because I own the magazine. Oh. <laughs> have to, I'm there the you go. Little, and I'm the only, I'm the, my only claim to fame is I'm the only dentist who's listened to all my podcasts and read all my articles. No other dentist on earth could say that. But the reason I love it is because when I have over the years had said something wrong in my columns and you and Joey D and Brad Gettleman and Ben Johnson and, uh, and these great minds that you couldn't even, that most people couldn't even get on the phone are taking the time to tell me where I was wrong. And I'm reading that like, I'm so lucky because most people carry around misinformation in their head their whole life and don't even know it. And every time you're transparent on Dental Town, if you're wrong, you're gonna find out about it in about eight seconds. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna find out you're wrong if you only got 300 followers on Facebook and you're all from the Mutual Admiration Club. So, um, you know, grow a pair of kahunas. Um, and uh, Ken, thank you. Thank you. I want you, to do, I want you to do three things for me. I want you to kiss Lori. I want you to kiss Hogo. Well. Just give him a little shake. I don't want you to kiss him. I would absolutely kiss Hogo. Oh, okay, yeah. kiss Hogo. And so, Lori, and I want you to kiss Rebecca. Um, Rebecca has been your uh, right-hand woman for, what, 20, how many years? Yeah, I got a bunch of ladies that have been there for 20 years. And I, 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 the only reason I'm still there is because I love it when they have to renew my life insurance policy and they lost money again for another year. <laughs> and, um, I always double down on the old man every year, every year. Well, old man, keep it cooking, my old man friend. You're doing pretty good for yourself. I, I thank you for this. I'll get the recording off because they all should hear a dental town from the guru. The guru needs to talk to the people and like this is uh it's a, you know what you're always an interesting guy because it's like listening to the encyclopedia Lindsay get over here right now I need you to repeat this to my okay. daughter-in-law hey, Lindsay Lindsay your... Lindsay he's, he's calling you by name she's probably worried about her hair I don't have any hair I'm on the damn show so, Lindsay, if you can hear me, your father-in-law is the Encyclopedia Dent Tanica. Oh, yes. I know. Well, I know. Down. Write that down. <laughs> Write that down. Encyclopedia Dent Tanica. Howard? Hi, Dan. Hi. Hi. We're wait, wait, wait. Will Raya at least say hi? Raya, your mom is too scared. Will you at least say hi? You got to see my little coronavirus. Come here, Lindsay. Come here, Raya. This is my little coronavirus, and uh, well, that's one cute. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! I want you to know it's been very tough because um, she's been very mean to her grandpa. She keeps slapping him. She keeps slapping him in the face. Raya, stop hitting grandpa! Raya, what are you doing? Ken, save me! No can do, my boy. All right. As always, you take care of yourself. Be safe. Right. And be well. And say hi to everybody for me. Okay? Okay, I'll get to this off in a bit. Okay.